uh, merry belated Christmas if we didn't see you last week. And we're, we're, it's good to see us taking in the new year uh, in the presence of the Lord and, and wanting to start it off right. Uh, you know, this is the way, as you're thinking about going into 2024, you know, this is where you want to start it, in the presence of the Lord, prayed up, uh, filled up with the things of God. And so as Christmas and uh, New Year is an opportunity for me to kind of speak a outside of what we've been talking through, kind of our, our core values. And so the title of my message this morning is called On the Edge. And there's something about a being starting a new year. It's kind of like a birthday. There's a marker in time. And oftentimes we don't think to, we don't think to ourselves it means very much, right? Like tomorrow, January 1st, 2024, will feel a lot like today. There's nothing really special about that Monday, other than that it's a marker in time for you and I. And so when it's a fresh start, when it's a new year, something happens. And, and I've noticed this as I've gotten older, like you get to 30 and you start to kind of slow down and then you hit 35. There's a marker in time, right? You went around the sun, 360. 35 is when the major decline happens, okay? I got back pain right now and I'm like walking gingerly and I'm just like, man, I did one thing wrong and now I'm, I'm taking medication to make sure my back is not out of place. You know? so, so the marker in time is significant because it's telling us You've, you've, you've went around this enough, and, and you've been around the sun, and, and this is going to be a fresh start for you. This is a fresh opportunity for you, and so on birthdays and on New Year's, it's, it's opportunities for us to take in a fresh start with what God is doing, and what I want to talk about to you today is out of Joshua chapter 1, as the people of God cross over from the wilderness into the promised land. As they go from one stage of life into the next stage of life, and the reason why it's significant is because they had been in the wilderness for 40 years. God delivered them out of slavery, and they were supposed to be in the promised land, but they weren't ready to be in the promised land, and so they went around that mountain over and over every year looking at the promised land, and for 40 years, they weren't prepared to enter it, and they would be right on the edge of the promised land, and they just couldn't go in, and they, and they couldn't go in, and it's, it's, it's as if God said, just wait. Now, if you ask me, I don't think patience is like one of my greatest spiritual gifts. I don't like to wait. I especially don't like to wait when I make an appointment. I don't know if you're like me, but if I make an appointment, whether it's a reservation, <laughs> and I show up to my restaurant to the reservation on time, and I get there, and the reservation is for 7 p.m., and I get there at 7 p.m., and you tell me the table is not ready, I'm not happy. You're not going to catch me in a good mood. That's happened to me multiple times. And you guys, you go to the doctor. This, this may be a pet peeve of yours. It's one of mine. You go to the doctor, and the appointment is what? 10 a.m., 9 a.m., whatever the doctor says, this is the appointment. Appointment. You get there at 9 a.m. You actually get there early. You fill out all the documentation. And what happens? The doctor sees you 30 minutes later, right? That's a pet peeve because you're like, well, what's the point of the appointment if you're just going to see me later? And especially when things are running behind, like you go to the barbershop and, and there's a guy still in the chair or ladies. I think it's worse for the ladies when the ladies are getting their hair done because, guys, you may have to wait 5, 10 minutes to get cut up. I know when Issa goes to get her hair done and somebody's running behind, it is an hour wait for the lady to finish up doing the other woman's hair before she gets to her hair. That is a pet peeve of mine because what's the point of the appointment if you just have to wait? And so here in Joshua chapter 1, it's as if God says, the wait is over. It's as if God says, you've been waiting for something for so long, and the wait is over. You had an appointment, and you weren't ready, but now the wait is over. And sometimes we feel that frustration with God, because maybe in 2023, you had made an appointment, placed an order showed up for something, and you thought God said, 
hey, this is what I have for you in 2023, but it wasn't ready. And then you know what's frustrating when you make an appointment or you plan to go somewhere and it's not ready for you, especially when you're at the restaurant and you see other people getting seated and you know your, your appointment was there, you know your reservation was there, but you see other people getting seated before you get seated. You know why that frustrates you? Because you had that appointment first and it's supposed to be set up for you. And so Oftentimes, we get frustrated with God because we make an appointment with God. We have a prayer request, but God says, well, just wait. You're not ready. You're not ready for it. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, and I'll read it here. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Just as I promised to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so faithful and you are so good. I pray that as we're stepping into this new season as there is an appointment waiting for us, as there are orders waiting for us, as there are things that you have set aside for us, promises that you've prepared for us, Lord Jesus, may we go into this new year full of faith and full of courage. Father God, would your word just speak, would it do its work that it's designed to do, to cut at the heart, to convict, and to build up. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Joshua gets this command from the Lord, and he tells him, Moses is dead. The wait is over. It's time for you guys to go into the promised land. This probably came as a shock because he had been waiting for 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years being led by a cloud, by day and a pillar of fire by night, 40 years living under the miraculous move of God. Joshua was with Moses when they were freed from Egypt, and so he knows far too well the stiff-necked disobedience, and so this comes as a surprise to Joshua because in Numbers chapter 13, Joshua was part of the company of spies that went to go into the promised land, and they spied it out, and so 40 years prior, Joshua goes into the land, and there's 10 spies that go in. Eight of them come back, and they say, man, the place is awesome. It looks great. I mean, they got fruit. They got luscious uh, areas, but they got giants in the land, and so, so we, can't, we can't go there. <laughs> We're not going to be able to go in. Joshua and Caleb are the only two that come back and give a report that says, God can do it. Let's go. But because of the other eight... And because of Moses, they don't go into the land. So they disobey God, and they say to him, we don't trust you to defeat the giants in the land. Yes, you freed us out of Egypt. Yes, you have freed us out of slavery. But taking the next step of faith and going into that land, God, we don't think you could do it. And so what God does is he puts the people of Israel into a spiritual timeout. (laughs) He says, okay, you're not ready for this. Sometimes we have to realize as God's people that the problem is not with the promise. The problem is with the people. Like sometimes you're in spiritual timeout because you're not ready to receive what God has intended to give you. Sometimes it is our very own disobedience that causes the delay of God's promise, not the promise itself. And so God says, well, in this time, in this season, the wait is over for you because now you're ready. But do you think your disobedience has kept you from the promises of God? 
That, that, that's the reason you can't go in. That's the reason you're not ready. Uh, I, I, I made an appointment, I remember, to see the dentist, uh, Dr. Lowry. He's not here right now. He comes to second service. And I, and I went on time, and I went on time, and I went to go see. He's a dentist, and I went to go see him, and, and I'm waiting to see him. And, and I showed up early, and they said, well, we're not ready for you yet because you haven't filled out the paperwork. And so there was all this paperwork I needed to fill out about my insurance. So the reason I hadn't got to see the dentist was not because he wasn't ready for me, but because I wasn't ready for him. I had not done my part. It is sometimes our very own disobedience that causes the delay. And the greatest disobedience we could ever have, guys, guys, I want you to hear me clearly with this. I don't want you to miss this point because oftentimes we think our disobedience is the sin of commission. It's something we did. It's something I've, I've messed up and I've done this and because I've committed this sin, I'm disqualified. I've been disobedient, but we don't recognize the sin of omission which is the things we did not do, the things God had asked us to do we didn't trust him with. The greatest sin here that caused 40-year delay of the promised land was disbelief, the disobedience of saying, God, I just don't trust you. I don't trust you with my new year. I don't trust you with my family. I don't trust you with my help, my health. I don't trust you with my business. I don't trust you, so I might not be doing anything wrong, but I'm not doing anything right either. And so we find ourselves waiting on the promises of God because we're not doing what we're supposed to, which is to trust God. Their disobedience was that they couldn't trust him. And every time we disobey God, there's a cost and a consequence. Every time. It's the law of gravity. Every time we disobey God, there's cost and consequences. And so some of 2023, it might have been God just testing you. It might have been God just dealing and working on you. It could have been the devil really coming after you and your family. It could have been temptation. But it could have also been a lot of the cost and the consequences of our disobedience. We cannot forget that when we live apart from God's truth and word, that there is a cost and a consequence. And so the people of Israel were wondering in the wilderness for 40 years. They could see the promised land. They could see the blessing. They could see it. And every year they would go around this mountain. Man, it's like running on a spiritual treadmill, right? There's a lot of spiritual activity in your life, but you're not getting any progress. There's not any breakthrough. You're not seeing any victory. Could it be the disobedience? obedience of unbelief. God, I just don't trust you. I don't trust you to step in to what I have for you. Sometimes it's just the cost and the consequence. We've all made those mistakes. We fail God often and regularly, and it is God's grace that does not destroy them because he's so merciful He doesn't say, I'm getting rid of you. You're my people. And the promised land has your name on it. That's the good thing about God, man. Once he puts your name on a promise, it's not going anywhere. Like when God calls you to something, it's not going anywhere. So you may have been in spiritual timeout, but the victory is still waiting for you. The breakthrough is still waiting for you. If God has put your name on something, he's not going to give it to somebody else. That land belongs to you. You just not might be ready to inherit it. But in 2024, as you're crossing over, is the wait over for you? Are you finished disobeying God through unbelief? Or are you willing to say, God, I'm going to trust you to go in? I'm going to trust you to go and to follow wherever you take me because there are things that have my name on it that I just have to trust you for. The wait is over. Point number two, if you're taking notes, is that God had to bury it. So the first thing God says to Joshua in verse 1, he says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now arise and go over this Jordan. There is no coddling. (laughs) There is no RIP, Joshua. I know you loved Moses. I I, I know he was a great leader for you. I I know you rocked with him for 40 years, and you guys guys were in the wilderness for a long time. There, there, There is no funeral. This was an announcement. This was an announcement to Joshua because no one knew what happened to Moses. If you 
Flip your Bibles just a page before Joshua chapter 1 and Deuteronomy 34. It talks about the death of Moses. You see, if you go to Israel right now, there's burial grounds for every major patriarch. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. Isaac got a grave. Isaac didn't even do anything in the Bible. He was just born, but he got a grave. People know where he's buried. The only person that's a major patriarch that doesn't have a burial ground in Israel is Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says that Moses goes up to be with God. God calls him to the mountain. He goes up to Mount Nebo, and he is there with God. And God shows him the promised land. He shows him all that the people of Israel would inherit. And it says that he dies alone with God in the mountain, and God buries him. God buries him. So the people are waiting at the foot of the mountain. And they don't know what's happened to Moses. They're just waiting. And they're mourning because they they know he's been preparing to go, but they don't know what's happened to Moses. Their beloved leader, the one that has led them through the wilderness for the last 40 years, the one that helped free them. Like if you read his eulogy in Deuteronomy 34, it says there is no one greater in all the Israelites other than Moses. He was the greatest Israelite to ever live. And it says that God had to bury him. And it comes at an announcement to Joshua because there's sometimes in our life when we're ready to cross over into what God has for us that some things you were depending on are no more. Some things you were waiting to return are buried and you can't cross over trying to carry the things that were last year into 2024. There are some things that you have to allow God to bury in 2023. Some things that you were dependent on, things that you love, things that you thought you needed. God says, no, you don't need it. I got to bury it so I can take you to what is next in your life. We become so dependent on other things rather than depending on God. And God has to bury it. God has to deal with it. Because he knows we love it too much to do it ourselves. There are some things in 2023 that you've held so near and dear that if God doesn't shut the door, you're going to keep pursuing that. If God doesn't deal with it, you're going to keep going after that. Uh, I was talking to my wife last night as I was thinking about this, and we were talking about her journey of medical school. My wife is say her whole dream since she was a young girl was to be a medical doctor. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to be a medical doctor. She believed God had called her to be a medical doctor. And so all throughout school, she was like, I'm going to go to med school. I'm going to become a doctor. She wants to become a pediatrician. So she studies child and kid development in undergrad, and she starts preparing for her MCAT. While we're dating, I'm seeing this whole thing play out. The first year we're dating, she graduates from college, and she starts to put in her medical school applications. She's believed her whole life God has called her to be a doctor. And so she's applying, she's applying, she's applying, and she doesn't get into the school that she wants to get into. She doesn't get into any of the schools that she thought she would, and there's one opportunity, but she doesn't feel like it's for her. And so what she does is she goes to Pennsylvania and decides to to study um, in a post-bac program and says, the post program tells her, if you get a 3.5 GPA, we will automatically enroll you into medical school here at this campus. And so she's focused all year. She takes a whole year out of loans. We're still paying back those loans, but God's got us, amen. <laughs> so she's there in Pennsylvania, and she's doing this post back program. And all she does is she goes to school, and the final test She scores a C, and she ends up finishing with a 3.4 GPA, not a 3.5. She has to move back to Dallas. Now we're back in Dallas, and she's in her second round of medical school applications. And she continues to apply, and she continues to apply, and she doesn't get in. And she realizes that that's not where God was calling her. God had to bury it for her. She loved it too much that every closed door became a sign, I'm bearing this thing in your life. She ended up studying public health, and now she works with doctors. And the irony is she sees how the doctors work, 
And she's like, I could have never done that. I would have never been happy doing that. God knew that it wasn't for me, and he closed the door. And there are some things in our life God has to just continue to close the door until we realize God is just bearing something that I've thought this was for me. Joshua thought Moses was always going to be there to lead, and he needed the announcement that this is dead. And there is no body. There is no closure. There is no RIP. There is no funeral. And there are some things that God buries in our life, and there is no closure for us. Like there are some relationships that will end in your life, and there will be no apology. There will be no closure. They won't explain themselves. God just has to bury it because he knows you won't do what is necessary to cross over from the toxic relationship into the healthy one. And so what does God do in his providence? He buries it. You see, for us to cross over, it's not just that the weight is over. It's that we have to bury the things that we can't carry with us. Moses was called to take the people out of Egypt. He was not called to lead them into the promised land. What is it in 2023 that God called you to, but he hasn't called you to take into 2024? What are the things that you may be carrying with you right now that you really know you need to bury? You really know you need to let go. You really know you need to leave it in the past because if you try to take it into 2024, it's just going to continue to cause more chaos and destruction. God just has to bury some things in our life. And if we're unwilling to do it, and he does it. And that's not always as fun. Point number three, you only possess what you pursue. When you're crossing over into the promised land, as God said to Joshua, listen, man, I want to kind of describe to you. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1, and this is what God does as he begins to mark out the boundaries of the promised land. He says, from the wilderness and of this Lebanon as far as the great river, the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. The promise is big. The promises of God are always big. The plans of God are always big. What God has in store for us are always big. But what does he say in verse 3? He says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. You can't have it until you walk in it. So there are things that God has promised, and they're huge as far as you can see, but you can only possess what you're willing to walk in. You can't have it all unless you're willing to go there. You can't possess it until you've gotten there. And if you're not walking in the things of God, it doesn't actually belong to you. So we can look at the promises of God, at the faithfulness of God, and say, God, I want this. I want this in my life. But I'm not willing to take the risk to walk in it. There are a lot of promises in the scripture. But it's the ones that we walk in that he gives to us. A friend of mine used to tell me this, and I've stuck by it. And he said, you only believe the parts of the Bible you obey. So there's things in the Bible. I mean, the Bible is much deeper than it is wide, and there's a lot in there that we read, and there's a lot of promises and good things for God's people, but we don't walk in obedience to that because we don't believe it. And so as much as we could say this is the promises for Christians and believers, we don't walk in it. And so Joshua 7, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, he says, "Let let me show you how to possess it. Let me show you how to walk in this. Because you want to cross over. So the wait is over. This is your time. This is a new year. This is a fresh start. And, and God is bearing some things that are old into new. But let me, let me show you how to walk in this. And this is what God says to Joshua in verse 7. He says, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen, but you just got to be strong and courageous. Like that, that is the first thing to possess it. Like you, you, you know, 
God is telling Joshua to be strong because he felt weak. Like, like if God is giving someone an encouragement, so, so you're not alone here if you're scared. You're not alone here if you're reading things and you're saying, man, I'm dreaming big dreams and I, I just don't know what to do with it. Like, like God wouldn't tell Josh, Joshua, be strong if he didn't feel weak. He wouldn't tell him, be courageous if he wasn't afraid. He wouldn't tell him, don't be dismayed, if he wasn't ready to quit at every moment. The reason he needs this encouragement is because he has been so humbled and so broken through the wilderness. You see, guys, I think sometimes we're just so full of ourselves that God can't use us or work through us because we're too confident. We believe too much in ourselves. We need to get to a posture like Joshua that says, man, I really need God to encourage me because if he doesn't do it, I can't do it on my own. You only got to be strong and courageous, and you only got to walk in it. Some of us are too full of our own plans and our own ways of doing things, and we haven't been broken to a place of empty. When I read in the New Testament about what Paul does and what he says, you see the posture of his heart, and he says, I'm the least of all the apostles, not even worthy to be called an apostle. He says, I'm the chief of all sinners. That's why God has chosen to use me. He's been broken down to a place where he can be dependent on God. So you get to a place where God says to you, be strong and be courageous. Because in your weakness, my strength is perfected. Like I get glory when you don't feel like you can do it on your own. Either you need to be humbled or you need to dream bigger. But one way or another, you need to get to a place where you say, man, this is scary. Like, what I'm asking God to do in 2024 is scary. I cannot handle this on my own. There's no way I can do this on my own. If God doesn't show up, it's it's not going to work in my favor. There's no way this will work. He said, be strong and very courageous. He says, I'm with you. I want you to meditate on the word of God day and night. I love that beginning of the new year, we have a a rhythm of prayer and fasting. I encourage you, if you don't fast very often, if you don't practice that rhythm, to start. There is no secret sauce to walking with God. This is what God tells Joshua. You meditate, you pray, you walk with me. You don't stir to the left or to the right of my word, and I'm going to give you all the success you could ever dreamed of. I'll make you prosperous in every way, but but you got to meditate on my word day and night. There there is no shortcut. There isn't a way that we can hocus pocus and magically appear. It says that you meditate on God's word day and night, and you don't turn from it. Like, like when we go into, I, I was telling our team, man, I'm so excited about this season of fasting and prayer. Last year was so cool. Like everybody, uh, I, I remember everybody was so excited about getting on this Daniel's fast. We were all like, hey, we'll do the Daniel's fast. And everybody was like changing their, their, their you know, even when we'd go hang out, everyone's eating the, the Daniel fast menu and, and we were praying together and people are sending out requests. And it was this rhythm of saying, man, we're going into this new year full of the Holy Spirit and full of the word of God. And it carried us all year. It carried us into the season because the recipe is you want to have courage and you want to be full of faith, but faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by knowing what he has to say to us. Not turning to the right or to the left means I know exactly which direction I need to be walking. That means I've been spending time in the word of God. If I don't spend time in the word of God, you know, it it just says I'm not prepared to possess the promises of God. That the problem is not with the promise. The problem is with me. That I'm going to come around this mountain and I'm probably going to pass by it again because I'm not willing to step in to the promised land. Like, like God will fight our battles for us. Like, like the very first fight they go into, God shows them, like, like, like you guys have never seen God work. And that's what he's telling the people of Israel. He's like, you guys have seen the miracles in the wilderness, but, but you, don't, you weren't there when I delivered the people out of Egypt. And so this is what God does. The very first fight in Joshua chapter 6, they get to the wall of Jericho. 
And these are people not of war. They've, they've never had a fight before. They're, this is a whole new generation, and, and they're not people with the mindset of slavery. They've been in the wilderness, and so they've been preparing their hearts for this moment the whole time, and they're thinking, okay, we're going to go in here, and there's battles ahead of us that we got to fight, and God is saying, let me show you what a fight with me looks like. Like, let me, let me set the stage for you. And so they get to Jericho, and Jericho is a fortified wall, impenetrable wall. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? So God tells the people, I want you to just walk around the walls of Jericho. I want you to walk around it once a day for seven days. I don't want you to do anything spectacular. This is very mundane. You're just going to walk. The whole army of Israel is just going to walk around the Jericho wall. And on the seventh day, what you're going to do is you're going to walk around this thing seven times, and then you're going to let out a praise and a shout and I'm going to show up. And that's exactly what happens. They walk around it once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day, they walk around it seven times. And they shout and they praise. And the walls of Jericho fall down. And it crushes all the inhabitants of Jericho. And all they have to do is walk in and possess the promise. you got to walk in it. You can't possess it until you walk in it. God is going to fight the battles for us, but you got to walk in it. And he says, you just got to do the mundane things. The, the seven times, once a day for seven days, it's just the mundane things. Can you do a devotional once a day for seven days? It's just the mundane things. Can, can you show up on a Sunday and let out a shout of praise? It's just the mundane things that lets out the breakthrough, the wall of breakthrough in your life. It's just doing the mundane things and allowing God to show up in the spectacular. He, we don't have to do anything extraordinary. All we have to do is show up and walk in it. And he says, if you can be courageous enough, bold enough, crazy enough, look weird enough to walk around a fortified wall, not shooting bows and arrows, not throwing swords, all you're doing is walking in the command of God. I said, I'll do the rest. I'll do the rest. And so 2024 is your year. Can you just do the mundane things to possess what God has for you? The wait is over. You don't, you don't have to wait on it. This is a fresh start. This is a new season for you. And, and, you, and you get an opportunity to bury those things in the past and, and walk in the promises of God for today. I'm going to call the worship team up here as we prepare to close in the mundane things. We remove all the shortcuts of holiness, and we prepare ourselves to just receive what God has. In Joshua chapter 3, as they're crossing over the Jordan, God commands Joshua, and he tells the people, I want you to grab a stone that is so big I want you to grab a stone that you, you almost have to carry it. Like you got to pick it up and you got to carry it. It's not a small stone. And so you have millions of people crossing through the Jordan River. And he says, I want you to go back. And as the Ark of the Covenant is passing through and as the presence of God is passing through, I want you to go back and I want you to pick up these stones. And I want you to get 12 stones from the Jordan River that you're going to take with you into the promised land. And he says in Joshua chapter 3, the reason I'm telling you to do that is because one day you're going to look back because there's battles ahead of you. G guys, I, I don't want to sugarcoat a New Year's Eve message and act like, you know, you guys hear those messages, all oh, the best, it's going to be the best year ever, and you're going to be blessed, and, and you're going to prosper, and hey, there's battles ahead. I just want to, uh, 2024 will not be uncontested for you. 2024 will not be a smooth process. Because whenever we're grabbing territory, it's always contested. Joshua goes into the promised land, and there are battles ahead that God has to bring the victory. It's not a smooth, it's not, a, it's not smooth sailing. They get in, but they got to fight to keep what is theirs. And he says, but I want you to take memorial stones, one for every tribe. It's a big stone because I want you to remember what I did today. 
I want you to remember my faithfulness today, that when you're in the heat of the next fight, I want you to look back and remember, man, we crossed through this Jordan, and God tore down the wall of Jericho, and he showed up, and we were in the wilderness for 40 years. We were living off manna and quail, and now we're in this land flowing with milk and honey. Like, I know where God has brought me from, and I know where I'm at, and I'm willing to fight these battles, and I look at this memorial stone as a reminder. And so as we prepare to close this morning and respond, you know, sometimes we plan and we have a vision board and people write down what they want to see God do in 2024. And and if you have your notes on your phone or if you have pen and paper, you know, I I want you to dream. What what, what are the promises of God that he's saying, man, I have for you in this new year? What are the promises of God? What are you crossing over into? You're saying, man, God, I'm, I'm really trusting you for this in my life. Because that's easy to write. It's easy to write big dreams. But today I also want you to write faithful memories. What has God done in this last season of your life where he's proven to be faithful, where he showed up over and over again? What are times in 2023 where God has not failed you? God has showed up. He's provided. He's came through. Because we want to take these memorial stones into the new year to be reminded that God was faithful then and he'll be faithful now. He gave you breakthrough then, he gave you breakthrough now. The battle may be different, but it's the same God that's fighting for you. It's the same one that's going to bring you through. You may have a different task. You may have a different fight. But it's the same God that's going to carry you. So I'm I'm going to invite us all up to, to stand and to worship. And we're going to respond. And you can write this stuff.